Every 24 hours, as humankind resets the clock, we have the opportunity to reinvent our world. Tomorrow, when dawn breaks, history is moved forward into a new era of electric flight. Please welcome Archer founder and CEO, Adam Goldstein. I love the energy. Thanks for bringing it. It just seems so clear to me what the future is, but I don't know, maybe I'm just too close to it. I can see these aircraft being adopted, widely used on an everyday basis. I see the technology every day. We've talked about the certification path and it's super clear. It feels like, like the way that the internet, it just became the backbone of society. Or just imagine coming here today, but you forgot your smartphone at home. Change takes you by surprise, but it's really obvious when you're looking backwards. And the goal is that after today, hopefully our vision becomes clear and it's just as obvious to you about what's to come. There's a paradigm shift happening in, in transportation. The future of movement, it's being reinvented. The largest auto companies, they don't even call themselves auto companies anymore. They call themselves mobility companies. Rideshare, it, it changed the way we use cars. And now the technology, it just keeps advancing and we're set to make air travel just an everyday experience and not just for long distances. So we're about to show you our production aircraft midnight. And Midnight is the evolution of our demonstrator aircraft maker, which proved that our configuration and that our technology is commercially viable, and also that it's ready for the global stage. In a moment, we'll bring up the lights. But what you're about to see, it really wouldn't be possible without a world-class team that's been incredibly focused on two very simple goals. First, leading the commercialization of eVTOL technology. This is more than just an electric aircraft. We're building a completely new sustainable transportation ecosystem. And second, there's a real focus on design. Design is critical because we're inventing a totally new way to travel. And while today, most of us, we all travel because we have to, but tomorrow, the goal is that we'll all travel because we want to. Yes, this aircraft is quiet. You've heard that it's safe. You've heard that it's affordable. But even more than that, we designed this aircraft around the routes that need this service. And we did it with technology that can be certified. And it's been engineered to scale into a business that opens up a trillion dollar market. And while the early routes that we have announced will certainly save people time. This aircraft is really all about empowering us all so we can reimagine how we spend that time. This is the future. This is midnight. any aircraft that you've ever seen. And it's different because our entire approach to designing it was different. We had to literally reinvent how aircraft are designed. Midnight is flown by a pilot and it can carry up to four passengers. And it takes off and lands vertically, so it doesn't need a runway. But it also flies forward on a wing like an airplane, so it can fly fast and it flies far. 
flies 150 miles per hour, and it can carry 1,000 pounds of payload, and it can travel up to 100 miles. But this vehicle was optimized around rapid, back-to-back, 20-mile -back, trips in and around cities. And it can do this while being as safe as a commercial airliner, but also up to 100 times quieter than a helicopter. Since the advent of the airplane, aircraft have always been about utility, but we didn't want to just build a product that was about utility. We wanted to design and build our aircraft to combine high function with high emotion. It's just like the best modern day cars. With Midnight, you want to explore it, you want to touch it, you want to experience it. We're inspired by this kind of process, of creating an emotional product like you see in some of the best automotive brands today. Automotive design has had so many generations of design maturity, and so we sought out one of the world's best auto designers to help us create a completely new kind of aircraft. Together we solved some of the most interesting challenges that so far have been unanswered in aircraft design today. Like ingress and egress, could we design midnight to be as easy to get in and out of as a car? Or what about a view with big windows? One of the reasons airplanes have those little portholes as windows is because glass weighs so much. It's so much more than carbon fiber. So we had to figure out how to save weight everywhere to keep those windows big so you have a great view. Comfortable seating. Could we design a seat that literally gives you support but connects your body to the movements of the plane? We solved all those challenges and beyond them. Midnight represents this new kind of collaboration between aerospace, design, and engineering. Now here to talk about the design process for Midnight is our head of design and innovation, Julian Montuse. Thank you, Adam. It's been an incredible journey. And uh, I can feel that our mission at Arche is going to make a world impact. So yes, when I was working in the automotive industry, I saw eVTOL as the next big frontier. Why? Because electric propulsion is now able to lift a small passenger aircraft vertically. And as a designer, that changes everything. Today, commercial airplanes are built for extreme efficiency. And we knew at Arche we had to strive for mathematical excellence, but at the same time, we're creating a new way of living, and it has to inspire people. So we develop a unique design expression here to make air travel feel more personal. The golden age of flying in the 1950s was a great source of inspiration for us. And if you ask the pilot and the customer how they felt, like traveling in 3D for the first time was like a peak experience in life. And it led to a real fascination for the aircraft themselves. Well, we want to bring this magical feeling back. We want to connect our customer and our aircraft as one. And along with our partners, we want to lead the new era of vertical flight. To do so, our design philosophy is to advance human flight as a craft. And with only four passengers on board, we have a chance at the personal level to empower our customers' ability to feel like they're flying. Now, what about craftsmanship? Well, we're inducing the human touch throughout the entire process of creation. And this is the quote that lives in our head. The best way to predict the future is to create it. So we went for it. We started by transferring our mind onto paper with thousands of sketches, targeting the ideal state expression, then ultimately backcast throughout the feasibility studies. Here's where we landed. At this moment, that's an incredible energy building all across of Arche in order to make this vision a reality. Now, the next step was to bring life to the outer skin, sculpting it by hand and in clay. This is the process that we brought from automotive 
in order to physically generate an emotion that our customer will be engaging with. Now, we know that designing a performing EV tall aircraft is a really hard process. And this CAT file on the screen speaks to the effort that we put into the digital process. And for the landing gear alone, it took about 46 override to actually get to the point where design surfaces would meet the performance score. The reality here is that the outside skin cannot be designed alone, like it is in the automotive industry. The skin is the structure and needs to carry weight. And any surface deviation will be affecting the drag. Now let's talk about product identity. It's all around us with the things that we care about. So for Midnight, we made sure to integrate a unique vertical light onto the nose as Archie's first brand DNA signature so that everyone would identify our aircraft from a distance. Second, we made the aircraft look confident. This is a breakthrough architecture in a brand new space, so confidence is key to establish trust with our customer. And if you look at the proportion of the aircraft, it speaks to the incredible flying performance. It's the ratio between the lean body and the wide wingspan. It's the dihedral shape of the wing. And it's also the convergence of all the elements into one point, the center of gravity. Lastly, the aircraft, it had to be beautiful. Timeless beauty is achieved through fluid surfacing, not mathematical surfacing. And you can see those shots behind me, they are mesmerizing so that anyone could emotionally connect with our product. Now, what about the cabin experience? We designed a partial divider between the seats that will display your personal trip information, such that when you're approaching the aircraft, you can see your name assigned to your seat, but also your destination and your time to take off. The first moment you enter into the aircraft is key. And I think we've all been climbing into small plane or helicopter, and it's challenging. So our goal has been to make it hands-free. And we designed a unique landing gear that will enable the aircraft to sit lower to the ground, similar to the height of a mid-size SUV. So with midnight, you can easily get in with a small bag, a phone, and a cup of coffee in your hand. Now, another passenger benefit we looked at, it's the windows. We know that glass is heavier than composite. However, we prioritize panoramic windows so at 2,000 feet, you'll fully engage with the city below. Finally, with sustainable electric flight, it was important for us to integrate materials with their own unique sustainability stories. First, we choose the flax fiber to construct our seats. It's an invasive natural plant, highly absorbent of CO2, that needs very little irrigation. And second, we're using a fabric made from recycled content, like plastic bottles. Both materials are laid out into the cabin to be seen and to be touched at every flight. We think that this effort is joining our passengers' desire to make a world positive impact. So tonight, the maturity of a production aircraft is a true celebration between design and engineering working together. So please join me in a big round of applause for all the LG have worked so hard to make Midnight possible.
I swear, every time I... I swear, every time I hear Julian speak, it, I feel like I need to go and get a sketch pad and just start creating. He's just emotional, and he just brings such an incredible energy uh, to this process. Building airplanes are hard. So when do you get to fly in this airplane? We're targeting certification by the end of 2024, and then to begin operations shortly after in 2025. We just announced our first point-to-point -point eVTOL route between New York City and Newark Liberty International Airport. And the plan is to announce many more in the near future. So this is a really pivotal moment in aviation. There's this new golden age of electric flight, and it's the time where we create this desire to fly again. It gives us the ability to fulfill our mission at Archer, which is to unlock the skies for everyone, freeing us to reimagine how we live and spend our time. Thank you all for coming. I'd like to ask you to come join me on stage and come explore midnight. So come on down. All right. Pretty exciting morning, right? Well, welcome everyone and good afternoon. I'm Mark Messler. I'm Archer Aviation's Chief Financial Officer. We're very excited to be hosting our first open house. Where we're going to show you the technical progress we've made on our aircraft, give a detailed overview of our go-to-market strategy, and give you the opportunity to meet the broader team here at Archer. Those of you who were able to join us this morning saw the exciting test flight of our demonstrator aircraft maker. The performance of Maker and its low noise profile is the product of tireless work by our world-class team of nearly 500 engineers and aviation professionals. To be able to go from our first hover flight to wingborne flight in just under a year is an extraordinary task. For those of you who weren't able to join us this morning, we have another flight demonstration planned for tomorrow morning, and we plan to host more flight viewing days in the future, so stay tuned. While we are pleased to share a test flight of Maker, the star of today's show is Midnight, our production aircraft, which we'll be unveiling later today. As a reminder about the relationship between these two aircraft, Maker is a demonstrator aircraft that we use to validate our configuration, our aero model, our flight controls, and our tilt propeller system. We also used Maker as a certification test bed to establish the rules to which we will certify with the FAA. As Maker validated our technology, we gained the confidence to move forward and start the build of our production version called Midnight. We chose this path very deliberately because we believe it is the fastest way to certify an eVTOL, and to date, that strategy is clearly working for us. And we believe we are leading the industry in our go-to-market efforts. We look forward to introducing you to Midnight later today. Before we get into our presentation, I'd like to set the stage with some background on our aircraft and business plan. From day one, Archer's goal has been to create the fastest path to market with an EV tall aircraft that can perform rapid back-to-back -back flights in the range of 10 to 50 miles in a cost-efficient manner. At the core of our strategy is our economic model based on a four-passenger aircraft with short turnaround time on the ground. We're very pleased with the results of our recent technical and commercial progress which continue to validate that plan. Our aircraft is designed to carry 1,000 pounds of payload, which will accommodate a pilot plus four passengers. At our preliminary design review earlier this year, we validated our charging times of approximately 10 minutes following a 20-mile trip. And our expectations for the cost to manufacture our aircraft have remained within our original projections, as we have selected suppliers for approximately 64% of the aircraft's component by cost which we just recently announced two in the past two days. All of this is to say that the plan we laid out originally is rapidly becoming a reality for us. The technical progress of our aircraft is validating our economic model at every stage. And as we execute our plan, we're also fortunate to have some great partners to help us along this journey. We're very pleased to have some of our partners from United Airlines and Stellantis join us today. As a company, we are now focused on getting to commercialization. Prior to coming to Archer, my background is in frontier hard tech. I spent 11 years at Bloom Energy, which is an alternative energy company, and another year at Valancey, a drone logistics company. Without a playbook, at Bloom, we scale a brand new technology and new business model from pre-revenue to an NYSE traded company generating close to a billion dollars of annual run rate revenue. 
I know what it takes to navigate the unknown when introducing a new hardware technology. One of the key guiding principles is financial discipline combined with capital efficiency. And the good news here, and one of the many things that attracted me to Arch Aviation, is that we are executing a very capital efficient business model. We continue to be very deliberate in our expense management with a focus on discipline and leveraging the great talent of our nearly 500 team members that include some of the best aerospace and battery engineers in the world. We scrutinize each new headcount and each expense request with our forecasting and planning infrastructure, and we take a conservative approach to adding new costs and personnel. Earlier this week, we reached another significant milestone on our path to commercialization when we announced the location of our manufacturing facility in Covington, Georgia, where we'll be producing our midnight at scale. As we contemplate our manufacturing strategy, we're very pleased to be working with Stellantis, one of the world's leading automobile manufacturers for, ic for iconic nameplates like Jeep, Ram, Maserati, and others. To conclude, we're very pleased to share with you today the results of our efforts to date. We are now focused on certification and commercialization, and we believe we're set up for su success in both areas. Our partners at the FAA share our excitement for building out the foundation for an eVTOL ecosystem, and they are working with us to get to a satisfactory regulatory framework in place as quickly as possible. And on the commercialization front, the demand for this product already exists and will only continue to grow as we get closer to commercial launch. Thank you, and with that, let me outline the content of the presenters for the rest of the day. Dr. Michael Swaykuch, Alan Teepe, and Alex Clarabet from our battery and propulsion team will provide an overview of our battery and propulsion systems. Next, Tom Munoz, our COO, and Mike Romanowski, our head of government affairs, will discuss the FA certification process and our progress against that. And finally, our founder and CEO, Adam Goldstein, along with United's Mike Leskinen, will discuss in more detail our go-to-market strategy. We will be making some forward-looking statements today, so take a few minutes. <laughs> Digest this, you have to sign something on the way out. <laughs> With that, I will turn it over to Dr. Michael Swagekuch, who heads up our powertrain. Thank you, Mark. Um, yeah, uh, welcome to Archer. Um, let me talk about a little bit about me as a starter. Um, I'm Michael, I'm running the powertrain team here at Archer. Uh, a little bit about my background, I spent a couple of decades in the traditional automotive industry, and then um, joined a small startup located in Palo Alto at Deer Creek Road. Um, back then, we produced 30,000 cars a year. Now I think they are up to like roughly a million. Um, so I ran the powertrain team at Tesla, um, not only for the design engineering, but also for manufacturing engineering. Uh, in my tenure over there, we did the drive units uh, for Model 3, Model Y. We overhauled Model S and X drive units, laid the groundwork for uh, Roadster 2 and the semi-truck, who will be, which will be launched later this year. The, the importance back then for me was always the strong connection between the design and the manufacturing uh, portion of it. We built some pretty leading-edge assembly lines and, and manufacturing lines for a few hundred million dollars over there. Um, my team was never in production hall, but obviously we had to help out when others were. Um, so that was a really amazing um, experience that taught me a lot for the, the stuff that is to come here, but also the stuff that I have been working on since then. After Tesla, I worked uh, in Apple special projects uh, for almost three years. Um, I really can't talk about what we worked on, but it was very, very interesting, as you can imagine. And um, yeah, then I decided it's time to do something new, and I decided to join Archer. And one of the reasons why I decided to join Archer um, is um, the, the bullet points that you see on the next slide. Um, at Archer, we have something that we call realistic innovation. And let me elaborate a little bit on that. Um, when you look into Silicon Valley, there is a lot of leading edge, um, next generation innovation. Uh, everything is questioned, everything is turned upside down, and we, we develop a lot of stuff. But there is typically two items, 
um, that Silicon Valley companies struggle with a little bit. Um, and one is obviously the, to focus on the stuff that really makes a difference. At Archer, we focus our innovation on the stuff that makes a difference. Um, a difference for our customer and a difference for our product. We don't think there is a point in developing new tires for an eVTOL um, um, aircraft. Um, there is other companies out there, our supply base, we have like world-class suppliers that can help us in many, many areas that support us. Like, um, why, would we, uh, why would we go and, and try to reinvent the wheel in this case, um, just for the sake of reinventing the wheel? Um, we really want to focus on the stuff that will make a difference, and um, the stuff that will make a difference, obviously, in an eVTOL application is the electrified powertrain, because that's the thing that is different between traditional aircrafts and, and eVTOLs. The second item that Silicon Valley companies typically struggle with a little bit is um, you have to get it done 100% before you launch. I mean, uh, just Remember your last smartphone, how long did it take until you got a software update? A week? Two weeks? Obviously, when you're talking about aviation, you cannot do that. Um, one, it would be the wrong thing to do, and two, obviously the FAA won't let you launch a product and then say, well, we will fix it in the field later on, right? That's not a thing that will fly with them. So these two topics were really attractive for me when I decided to join Archer. And there were a, a, a couple of other topics um, that we are optimizing our system design for. And first and foremost, it's safety. Um, this airplane has to be safe. Uh, there is no other way to do it. I want to fly in it. I want my family to fly in it. Um, so we can't cut any corners, and safety is front and center in this company. And that was really, really attractive to me. Next one is efficiency. Every single watt of energy that we waste because we are not 100% or close to 100% efficient has to be stored in the battery pack, has to be charged into the battery pack, has to be paid for from the grid. So it is ultimately important to have a very, very efficient aircraft and also a very, very efficient powertrain. Which brings me to the next point, power density. And maybe you can easily uh, call it lightweight. The powertrain itself has to be as lightweight as possible, but still do the job, because you want payload. We have an aircraft that has more than 1,000 pounds of payload, and we want to maintain it this, this way. Just imagine we would waste another two or 300 pounds on the powertrain and had a payload of 600 or 700 pounds. We wouldn't have a product, because we want to fly for passengers in our airplane. And we don't want to end up with a glorified school bus. We want to end up with a product that can transport for grown-ups and the pilot. The last one is commercialization. Um, what drives me typically is seeing my product out in the wild. I'm not a researcher in terms of uh, spending a lot of time at Stanford or uh, at one of the universities that I've seen in my career. I really get excited when I can ship a product. And Archer has a very, very clear commercialization strategy, a very clear strategy of designing a product that is safe and going to market in the shortest amount of time possible. And those typically really important points were super important to me and also one of the, or one of the driving factors um, that made me decide to join Archer. So how do we make all of this happen? Um, it's very easy how to make it happen. It's very difficult to do it. Um, to make this happen is you need a world-class team. Um, and when I say world-class team, I mean really, really, really good engineers that um, I have worked with in my past careers that have slept on the Gigafactory floor in Nevada when the shit hit the fan. Sorry for the rough words. Um, but that really can plow through it even if times get rough. That is really important that you have a, a leadership team and a team that you can rely on and that will get the job done. And when you look into the team that we have assembled, um, we basically hired from 
all over the place. We are not religious about it has to be Silicon Valley, it has to be traditional automotive, it has to be traditional aviation. We are religious about hiring the best people. We have people from Apple, from NASA, from some of our competitors, from Tesla, obviously. Um, we have people from GM, um, from Boom Energy, not only our CFO. And uh, we have assembled a team that has more than 200 years of experience just in the leadership team uh, of powertrain experience. And when I say powertrain experience, I mean products that ship. I don't mean products that could maybe exist at some point in time. Um, the total team that is working on powertrain is roughly 100 employees. Um, that's also supporting functions, obviously, uh, but that gives you a, a, a glimpse into what we focus on, but also what we put our efforts into, and that is obviously one of the halo things that, that we have to build and have to deliver. And before we go into um, a little bit of uh, better understanding of two of the most important systems in the powertrain, you will see some pictures in the presentation later on. Um, some of the pictures have hidden stuff that we don't want to disclose as of now. Just because you see a picture of a cutaway model, it doesn't mean that all the bits and pieces are in there. So bear with us. But uh, we need to keep a little bit of the secret sauce uh, and not give it all away. Uh, we feel we have pretty well protected us with IP before this presentation, obviously. Um, but some of the stuff is still in the making, and some of the stuff is just not 100% ready to be filed. That's why we couldn't show it to you. So just because you see something or don't see something, it doesn't mean it's, it's actually not there. Uh, with that, I want to turn it over to Alex Rarewood. Alex is um, my head of battery development, and we worked together at Apple for a couple of years. And he will talk you a little bit through the design of, of our battery pack. Alex. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Um, my name is Alex Clarebutt. I'm the director of battery systems here at Archer. Uh, prior to coming to Archer, I worked for six years at Apple on special projects group. Um, I managed a battery team there. And before that, I started my career in solid oxide fuel cells, working on stationary power generation. Um, and if you go way back, I, I developed my first battery systems in middle school for a worldwide competition. So I've got a, a long and varied past in developing systems for uh, power efficiency and energy. So why did I come to Archer? Uh, first of all, I'm a pilot. Um, I actually got my pilot's license just across the street a couple of years ago. Um, so I, I love aviation. Um, and then also, I love batteries. So electric aviation is a pretty good spot for me. But I'm also a battery skeptic. Um, and before Archer, I didn't really see any companies out there that were doing anything with realistic innovation like Michael talked about. What we're going to talk about today is something that we can produce today. Um, so that, that really excited me when I met the team here. So um, I'm going to talk to you about our high voltage power system. But before that, I want to reiterate what Michael said about the team. The battery system team has about 30 engineers directly working on the battery. Um, they come from places like NASA, Apple, SpaceX, Tesla. And we really hired a group of people that's got experience taking uh, high performance batteries into production. And I'm excited to talk to you about what the team's come up with for midnight. So first of all, before we get into the details, like why do we need a battery? Um, Basically, we're taking a traditional aircraft, that's energy sources, jet fuel, or aviation fuel, and we're replacing it with lithium-ion battery cells. Um, lithium-ion batteries are great. Um, they, you know, the, one of the nice things about them is they can use sustainable energy to recharge, um, but the downside is they're heavy. And so the, the group and the team here has to do uh, really great optimization around minimizing mass of the battery so our plane can fly. So where does that start? It's basically this plot right here on the right-hand side. Um, we've got a set of Archer requirements, but this basically outlines the, the performance requirements for the battery. And I'll talk you through them from left to right. So 
power, electrical power on the y-axis, time on the x-axis, and this is uh, basically an example of our longest range trip. So it's about 50 to 60 miles. And so for the battery, what's important are these peaks here. And I'll, I'll talk you through them. So first of all, the plane takes off. It's a vertical takeoff. We're hovering a 6,500 pound aircraft. It takes a lot of power. Just to contextualize this, it's about 1,000 horsepower to hover. 1,000 horsepower is you know, equivalent to a Formula One race car, a significant amount. So then we transition to climb, cruise, descend, and we have another high power landing down there. So this is normally our longest range trip, but we also have to account for uh, heading to an alternate airport. So the dotted line shows this alternate mission. We have another, we immediately have another high power takeoff, climb, cruise, descend, and then another high power landing. Important part here is we design it so we can have a landing with an equipment failure at the worst part in time. So what that means is the battery can fail, the engine can fail, and we can still land safely. The downside for the battery is that takes a lot more power. So that really high peak right there on the right-hand side is the, the sizing case for us. If you're familiar with lithium-ion batteries, um, they don't like that. They like to provide power on the left-hand side of this plot at the highest state of charge, and then they, they can provide less power as you lower the state of charge. So that's, that's really important for us, and that's really what sizes our battery pack here. So um, these are our performance requirements, but it's just a subset of all of our requirements. So on the left-hand side here, we really think about safety, certifiability, and then performance requirements, and then we go down to commercialization. And I'll talk you through those. So after we have our set of requirements, what do we do from there? We, we have to figure out what the plain high voltage architecture is. So, you know, basically, how do we decide our architecture? We had, you know, weeks, months worth of uh, debate on this. And what was in focus for us was safety and commercialization. So we came up with something pretty cool and proprietary. We have six batteries. Each battery pack supports two motors. The battery packs are 800 volts, um, but there's connections between the batteries that allow them to intelligently shuttle energy back and forth. So this is important in case of a battery pack failure. Another battery pack can take over, but it also allows you to isolate the batteries from each other. So again, if there's something that happens on one battery or one engine, other batteries and engines can take over. So um, two key things on this. It's obviously safe. It's fault tolerant to potential failures, but it also enables us to reduce the power requirements at the battery cell level by 20% compared to a standard high voltage architecture. So 20% um, is significant. If we had to add 20% of mass of battery cells back into this, it'd impact our payload by about 300 pounds. So this architecture is a huge enabler for us. The other thing about this is when you reduce power, you get a bigger catalog of battery cells to choose from. Ultra high power uh, battery cells are kind of a niche market, but as you reduce power requirements, you get more and more cells available to you. So we've got our architecture, now we choose the battery cell. And the battery cell is critical. It's a, the building block of the entire battery system. There's anywhere from 100 battery cells to thousands of battery cells and a high voltage battery pack. And basically, it's the only thing in the battery pack that's storing energy, providing power. So it's you know, obviously key to making this aircraft fly. So when we, we think about selecting a cell, we don't really care about what the cell can do by itself. We really focus on what the cell can do in the context of the battery pack, battery system, and in the aircraft. So again, we come back to safety and commercialization. There's three cell form factors that are commonly available. There's cylindrical cell, prismatic cell, pouch cell. We chose a cylindrical cell for a couple reasons, um, starting with safety. So a pouch cell is probably the highest energy density and power density cell on the market. Problem is, there's not a dedicated safe architecture. So a pouch cell doesn't have a cell vent. And the FAA, when we go to certify this battery pack, 
we have to force a cell into thermal runaway in the battery pack and make sure the battery pack responds safely. So thermal runaway is when hot gas flames come out of battery cell, it's hard to do. So with a pouch cell, without a dedicated safe architecture, it's even harder to do. And so even though it's maybe higher energy density or power density at the cell level, you may have to give up that mass when you go and design your battery pack to make sure this is safe. So we throw pouch cell out the window. We've got cylindrical cells and prismatic cells left. The next thing about safety, you know, going back to thermal runaway, the lower the energy of the cell, the lower the energy of the thermal event. And so cylindrical cells, they're pretty good energy density and power density at small energy levels of the cell. Prismatic cells are not. So we went with a cylindrical cell. It's got a proven safe architecture, demonstrated reliability, decades of volume manufacturing. In fact, Tesla shipped about 4 billion cells, 2170 cylindrical cells uh, last year in the Model 3 and Model Y. So it comes with favorable econ economics and a significant supply base as well. And we're not counting on a technology breakthrough. We're not going with a fancy custom cell that's not gonna be available in 2027. It's available today. In the last 48 hours, um, we've signed an MOU with Molly Cell. Uh, Molly Cell or E1 Molly Energy is one of the original lithium battery uh, developers. It's actually founded in 1977 in Canada. So Molly Cell is famous for delivering power cells. They've developed EV cells for BMW, Zero, among others, and they've got a gig factory coming online in Taiwan in 2023. So we're really excited about this. We've been testing Molly Cell cells uh, for tens of thousands of hours in our Archer specific mission, just like we showed on the plot. And it's capable of over 10,000 plus missions, 10,000 plus average missions of 20 miles. Okay, so we've got our battery cell. What do we do with it? We have to design the battery pack. And this is up here is our battery pack for midnight. Like Michael said, this cutaway is awesome looking. It gets you a glimpse of inside, but it's missing some things. We're trying to, to save some secrets for later. What do we think about when we're designing this battery pack? Again, back to safety. FAA has some pretty stringent requirements, as they should, on designing a battery pack. We have to meet DO 311A. It's forcing cells into thermal runaway, making sure the pack responds safely. So we've got, we've done hundreds of tests at the cell level and the prototype level to ensure that we meet that standard. And we've come up with something pretty cool. We've got a proprietary thermal runaway strategy and it works great. So other things on safety besides thermal runaway. On top here, we have our battery management system. Just like our battery pack, if we have a failure with that or a failure with an engine and we can respond safely, if we have a failure with the battery management system, we've got enough redundancy in the system to be able to continue to fly safely. So those are the safety critical items on the battery pack, but it's also high performance. We talked about how critical it was to reduce mass. We've got engineers with experience in high performance composites and materials to ensure that we minimize the mass, increase the payload of the aircraft. The other thing about this battery cell and this battery pack design, when we, when we have to meet that really high power requirement for discharge, we kind of get for free a great charge performance. And so what we've shown is that we can do 10 minute recharge for our 20 mile average mission. And it's not just once, it's over and over and over. So the other goal for the battery pack team is not to make one of these, we need to make thousands of these. So ingrained within the battery design team is manufacturing engineers tons of experience in producing batteries, and we've basically implemented their feedback from day one of the design. So we're working with our manufacturing engineers to make sure that we can make thousands of these. So what are the, the key takeaways here? We have a safe, fault-tolerant design for our power system. It really, you know, not only is it great for our customer, but it minimizes speed bumps with the FAA. It's high performance, low mass. It supports our high payload in the aircraft. It's got a great turnaround time of about 10 minutes for a 20 mile mission. And we've shown over 10,000 plus cycles on this battery uh, when performing our 20 mile mission back to back. 
while maintaining some life after we take out the battery from the aircraft for second life applications. So that's our power system. I'll hand you over to Alan to talk about the electric engine. All right, thanks, Alex. Um, so my name is Alan Teepee, and I lead the inverter design team here at Archer. Before joining Archer, I worked at Tesla for eight years as a design engineer on the inverter team there as well. And for three years, I led the inverter mechanical design team at Tesla. I really enjoyed working at Tesla. It was just an awesome experience. All the engineers were incredibly talented and very driven. And while I was there, we went through four iterations of drive unit design. So that's basically the, the motor that propels the vehicle. And with each iteration, we focused on the engineering fundamentals of what makes the design work and really focused on simplifying the design down. And that was a big part of what enabled Tesla to scale up in production as well, because the, the designs got higher performance and then they got simpler with each iteration too, so they became easier to build. So at Tesla, electric propulsion really revolutionized transportation on the road. And when I learned about Archer and, and what they were doing with aviation, I yeah, just really wanted to be part of it too. I really think that electric propulsion is going to revolutionize aviation as well. So today I'm going to talk about the electric engine design. Uh, before I get into that, I wanted to talk a little bit about just electric motors in general. They're, they're really incredibly simple at their core. So an electric motor typically consists of, um, it's a rotor on the inside, and you can think of the rotor as basically just a round magnet. And then on the outside, you have a ring of electromagnets that we call the stator, and that is really just a segmented magnet that you can turn on or off using a switch, and the switch is really the inverter, kind of the driving system for it. So really how it works is, is you just turn on those electromagnets on the outside in a circular pattern, and that produces torque between the two sets of magnets, and that drives the output. So it's fundamentally really simple. It's really magnets chasing magnets. It's drastically, um, drastically simpler than an internal combustion engine, where you have fuel that's being pumped in. You have to ignite the fuel. You have to have the right air fuel, make sure to be efficient. And it's, it's uh, explosions that are driving pistons, and it drives like a shaft that does the output. It's, it's just very simple components here. So when I joined Archer, we're our team of 20 design engineers was tasked to design the electric engines. And the key design requirements for this were that we needed to hover the aircraft, so lift off from the ground and hover, and then transition to cruise flight. And the most challenging part, really the sizing case for the engines, is that hover portion. So there, all the weight of the aircraft is supported by the thrust of the engines, whereas in cruise, the weight is supported by the wing. So really, the engines are sized for that thrust case. Uh, some of the constraints or challenges with this is that in order to have a low noise profile, we want to spin the propeller at a low speed, but a very high torque. So we want to limit the speed of the propellers such that they're not too loud and they cause noise for the passengers or people on the ground. Uh, we also need to minimize the weight, so we want to maximize the, the aircraft payload, and most importantly, safety. So we need to make sure that aircraft has a high standard of safety and no single point failures. So with these, constraints, the first big decision we made was deciding on the number of engines. And one of the big drivers here is you have to make sure that the thrust on all sides of the aircraft is equal in hover. Because if you we wanted to make sure we had no single point failures, and if, as you can imagine, if you only have like four propellers and you lose one of the corners, you can't really balance out the load with the other three propellers. So we looked at a ton of different options for this, and we decided on 12 propellers overall. So six tilters in the front that tilt forward and power it in cruise flight, and then six lifters in the back that are only used in that high power portion in the beginning when you're hovering off. And this was a big decision because it gave us a, a high level of redundancy. So we have redundancy at the propeller and the engine level. So you can lose propellers on opposite sides and still keep yourself balanced and maintain hover. So that's really important for our overall strategy. So once we had selected the number of propellers, we, that gave us basically the detailed thrust requirements for each propeller, and we were able to start the detailed design of the engine. So here we had the team of 20 design engineers. We spent months going over every different conceivable design option and brainstorming on whiteboards, coming up with everything we could do to simplify the design. And at the end, we came up with this engine design. So we have a sample right here. So I'm really proud of all the work that we did on this, and it's a, it's a great design overall. So it's a, it's very safe 
So we were able to add additional redundancy levels inside of the engine, in addition to the overall engine redundancy. It's also very simple. So we're using mature technology that's already used in other products or it's out in the field. So for example, like in the inverter, we're not using components that are brand new and haven't been tested in the field yet. We're using components where we have a good track record of field performance to make sure we're not learning things on our first builds that we shouldn't be. Um, and I think also very importantly, it's very lightweight. So using this engine, we were able to help achieve our 1,000 pound plus payload at the aircraft level. Another thing we were able to do is maintain design commonalities between the tilter and the lifter. So we have about 95% of the same parts between them. Really, it's just the two outer housings that are different, outer housings and the output shaft that are different. And this is important for um, basically scaling up our manufacturing operations. So we're going to effectively have the same line that's produ producing both sets of engines, and then we just put the different housings on at the end. And it was maybe a slight compromise in overall performance, like if we had separate engines, we could have maybe slightly better weight overall, but this was really important for, for scalability. Uh, as I said before, we were able to build in some redundancies inside the engine. So for a very little mass penalty, we were able to add in a dual wound motor and a dual inverter. And for mini failure modes, if, if one of those sides fails, you can just use the other side to continue outputting uh, torque to the propeller and keep flying on your mission. So it's similar or electrically similar to having actually 24 engines in the aircraft. So it's really a pretty big step in extra redundancy. So one way to highlight how simple our engine is is to compare it to an internal combustion engine. So here I have a comparison between our engine and the engine that's in a typical 172, Cessna 172 aircraft, which is one of the most common aircraft in the world. So in the Cessna 172, you have 10 gallons an hour of fuel coming in. You're igniting that fuel, making explosions that are really loud, and um, driving, yeah, driving pistons that basically push the propeller. And in doing that, you're generating a ton of waste energy. So 330 kilowatts of waste energy coming out, that's really enough energy to heat 14 houses. So it's a, a massive waste of energy there. With with internal combustion. You've got a bunch of emissions, so like 90 kilograms an hour of CO2, and the most common aviation fuel actually still has lead in it, so there's also 20 grams of lead coming out the back as well. Um, so it's, it, and additionally, there's a ton of moving parts. So all those components are moving around. There's lots more wear mechanisms in the design. So you have about 160 moving parts in the Cessna engine. And we can contrast this to our engine, which have a, a similar peak power level. And here you just have HV power coming in, 132 kilowatts, and you're just basically creating those magnetic fields to produce the torque at the output. And you have seven moving parts overall. So much less waste heat. It's very efficient. It's um, it's also drastically lighter, so it's about five times lighter for the same power output. So this is really the thing that helps to overcome the present technology of lithium-ion batteries. We're saving a ton of weight on the engines. So it's yeah, five times lighter, 21 times fewer moving parts, 50 times less wasted energy overall, and there's four times lower energy costs if you multiply out the cost of gas and the cost of uh, just yeah, basically charging off the grid. So one of the biggest decisions we made in our design is we decided to add a gearbox to the motor. And this was based on a huge amount of work by the electromagnetics team looking at all the different design options. And basically what we found in our design trade-offs was if you connect the motor directly to the propeller, it's not very efficient in terms of how much power out you get in ter um, versus the weight of the motor. Because it's a very high torque motor and a very low speed. And to get a higher power density, you really want to spin faster and kind of have a slightly lower torque overall. So um, we did a huge number of trade-off studies and basically found that if we, we could reduce the size of the motor, by spinning it much faster and then using a gearbox to trade that speed for torque at the output shaft. So this is shown here. It shows that on the left, we have our direct drive optimized design. And it's this huge pancake motor that connects directly to the output propeller. And on the right, we have the design that was optimized using a gearbox. And you could see we shrunk the motor down to almost half the size. And it was just a, a huge reduction in mass. So the motor is about half the size. 
Uh, overall, this has allowed us to increase the aircraft payload by more than 100 pounds. And it also has big benefits in terms of manufacturability. So with the big pancake motor, it's, um, it's outside the realm of most motor manufacturing processes. But adding the gearbox and shrinking down the motor gets us back in the realm of typical automotive motors. And so it really opens up the supply base. So it's, it's really a big decision, but uh, we really think this was the right direction to go. Uh, I also want to add, too, it's a, it's a relatively simple gearbox. So it's a, a small gearbox about this big. And we have a great team to execute on the gearbox. So the team has about 70 years of experience with gearbox design. And they've designed and shipped into production multiple gearboxes that are designed for million mile plus operation. So overall, our design that we achieved is very lightweight. And I put this together just to kind of highlight how it compares to other high performance motor designs. So for example, we have the Model 3 drive unit over here. And I also have shown a, a motor that was optimized for traditional takeoff and landing aircraft. And these are, they're not bad designs by any means. They're, they're really just optimized for their application. But you can see that the Model 3 drive unit, it weighs about four times as much as our motor, but the output power is less than double ours. So we have more than double the power output per unit mass. And uh, yeah, the other aviation motor, it's, it's not quite the same, but we have a higher power output per, per mass for that design as well. And really, this just highlights how critical it was for us to optimize and create a custom motor design for our aircraft. And in doing this, if, like, if we just started out and said, oh, we're just going to use these other high-performance motors that exist, if we had taken those motors and put them on the aircraft, the overall propulsion system would weigh about 500 pounds heavier than it does now. So really, it just shows the benefit and the need to optimize the motor for a particular application, which, which we've done. And I think the design we've achieved is, yeah, is really great in terms of mass. So overall, I wanted to thank the team. There's a, yeah, again, a team of 20 engineers that did a ton of great work on this. And I'm really proud to have been part of it. Um, our design is really safe with its multiple redundancy levels. It's uh, very simple, so we're using mature technology that's ready for mass production. And again, it's uh, super lightweight, so our design was a big part of achieving that 1,000-pound payload. So thanks for your time, and I'll hand it back to Michael. Thank you, Alan. Um, yeah, let's um, summarize. Um, to reiterate, uh, our prototype battery pack battery pack, battery management system. Um, you will have time to like, have a look at this. Um, the the um, electric engine that we designed with the inverter, the gearbox, and the motor inside. So this is it. This is all. Uh, there is no like additional boxes or something like this attached to it. And um, so what I want you really to take home, um, and we're not ending this presentation, but take home from the powertrain uh, area, uh, is a few key things. One is our strong belief in a realistic innovation. Um, focus on the things that make a difference for the product or for the customer in-house. Leverage our supply chain and supply bases for all the other things that have to come together to build a great aircraft. Uh, you've seen some of um, the announcements in the recent days um, around Garmin, around Molisol. Um, it, it is a, a very focused approach on innovate in the areas that make a difference on the product side and get it done in time. Um, that's what it really is. We talked about the battery, um, optimized for th safety, obviously, uh, really, really important. As Alex told you, um, you have to be thermal runaway tolerant. The FAA enforces you to bring certain battery cells in your battery pack into thermal runaway, and you have to show them that you don't end up with a problematic situation. Um, and also prevent propagation, um, because you have a lot of battery cells in here, and you have to have a design that even if one cell goes off, um, the other cells around it don't do the same. We need longevity. Um, we are performing on a, um, on a level of 10,000 average missions per uh, battery pack set. Um, we also need uh, short recharge times, 10, mi uh, 10 minutes recharge time for the average um, mission. And this is combined with a high efficient uh, electric engine. 
One, the efficiency of the electric engine enables a smaller battery pack size, obviously, because you don't have to utilize the energy that you waste then in inefficiency. But also, it reduces the charge times. Um, Alan talked to you about the gearbox design, which enables higher power density, which then enables higher payload. And uh, it's really, really important to us that we are using known building blocks. Um, and that enables us a, a safe and also achievable development cycle. Last but not least, I can't stress it enough, um, we have a world-class team. Um, we think the, the by far the best powertrain team in the industry. Uh, I've worked in my prior lives with most of them. Um, I can, I have seen what this team can do. I'm still seeing it every day. And we will get this in, in time, in quality, and convince the FAA. Um, so with that, I hand it over to Mark again. And he will take you as our MC through the rest. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Great job. I think you can see why we're excited about the differentiating technologies coming out of our powertrain team. I mean, some key themes, manufacturability, safety, payload enabling. I talked about our pathway to commercialization, trying to get to the fastest pathway to commercialization. So as much as we're making very significant technology advancements, those advancements are directly feeding into our pathway to revenue generation and commercialization. That's, that's something we always stress when we're talking to folks. So great technology, but listen, we're, we're doing this, we're gonna get this thing to market as well. So I'm gonna pivot a little bit to certification. Uh, certification, you'll have the very same theme, commercialization and how we're, how we're enabling uh, uh, commercialization through our certification process. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Michael Romanowski to take us forward. Thank you, Mark. And thank you all for being here this afternoon. I have to tell you, I am, feel so privileged, so honored to be able to be up here today to talk to you, despite the fact I've only been with Archer for about two and a half months as its new head of government relations. I am really, really proud to be an Archer. Uh, but before I talk to you about why I came to Archer, I wanna spend a little bit of time and talk about the certification process from my time at the FAA. I joined the Aircraft Certification Service in the FAA in 2017, late 2017, as its first Director for Policy and Innovation. Those that know the FAA know that that title by itself was a groundbreaking change for the FAA. Aligning policy, by that we mean policy in the broadest sense, the full framework for designing, manufacturing, continued operational safety of all aviation products, and the innovation side to continuously find ways to make that framework more effective, more responsive to the developments that were going on. It's a tremendous challenge we had to frame that for my my folks, we wanted the FAA to become more anticipatory and more proactive in response to the, uh, the advancements coming out of industry. So what we, were what we were charged to do, the mission was to understand the technical trends and to position the FAA to develop the framework and to implement the framework to make those advancements a reality and enter them into service. To help our team, my team, work with that, I coined a phrase. Industry innovates on technology. We, the FAA, have to innovate on policy. It's gathered a lot of legs over the years, but maybe you've heard it, but uh, it really resonated with our folks. So what we did was, uh, in 2018, one of the key features was I formed the Center for Emerging Concepts and Innovation. The idea of that was to work with companies as early as possible in their product development cycle. To come in, share with the new technologies they're developing, the new concepts and the new types of products so that the FAA could in fact gain insights into those technologies and start to chart that path for certifying those technologies and seeing them implemented into the national airspace. The benefit for the company 
was very early on, they started to understand what the requirements were going to be to field that product, how to certify that product, and how to move it into operations. Let me contrast that with how that has conventionally worked over the years. Typically, companies will design, develop a product, they'll start constructing the product, then they'll come to the FAA. And that puts both the FAA and the company behind the eight ball when it comes to certifying that product because very often there are new and novel things in that product. There are things that aren't anticipated in the regulations. There may be other issues where now they find that that product is a hard fit for the regulatory framework. And, but the problem, product is already designed, built. Modifying that product is extremely difficult, so it gets very difficult to execute the changes that are needed to safely certify that product. The Innovation Center idea reversed that by, again, bringing that in earlier, reducing the risk for the companies, allowing the FAA to position itself to bring that, help bring that product to reality. So Archer was one of the companies that truly embraced this Innovation Center concept. I still remember the first discussion I had with Adam back when Archer was still an idea, just an idea. And we talked about how, as he started to frame out the ideas of what they wanted to bring, pursue, to come into the FA and start walking through and framing out how do we move this product forward. And I will give him all the credit in the world. He did it, they did it. They came in very early in the design process and worked very closely with the FAA and it was really clear that the company was committed to a truly cooperative, collaborative partnership with the FAA in designing the aircraft with certification from day one. And I'm gonna turn over to Tom Muniz in a, in a couple minutes, and he's gonna share some of the details on how that, how that really worked and, and the like. So, but before I do that, I wanna talk about, well, why am I here at Archer? The first thing is, my experience over the past several years has shown me firsthand the potential of advanced air mobility in EV tall aircraft. I am a firm, passionate believer in the power of EV tall to not just bring revolutionary, transformative changes to society, new modes of transportation, new ways to access uh, communities and individuals, but I, we're gonna see huge environmental improvements, zero emissions, low noise, but maybe first and foremost is, I firmly believe that these vehicles are gonna markedly change the bar on safety. The levels of redundancy and simplified operations built into these vehicles, lower maintenance, is going to be a game changer for the industry. And history has shown that advanced technology insertion has resulted in tremendous safety improvements. Look, at, look back at the data. These vehicles are the next implementation of that. So, so that was key to me, the, the, this market incredibly attractive to me. But then I started looking at the talent that Adam has assembled. I think Michael's team that just talked to us is illustrative of the level of world-class talent that is in this company. And I understood that when I was considering coming over, but I gotta tell you, coming in, the level of talent is, it was, was even far beyond what I had even envisioned. It amazes me every day when I start talking to people, meeting people, understanding their backgrounds, understanding what they're bringing to the company and frankly to the world. I'm just amazed by the level of talent in this company. It's, it's astounding. And the third thing is that laser focus on commercialization. That is a massive draw for me. To see these ideas, these fantastic ideas become a reality, that really drew me to the company as well. So when the opportunity came for me to join Archer, it was an absolute no brainer for me to come here. And I am so happy that I did. I'm so proud to be an Archer and so proud to have the opportunity to talk to you all today. And with that, I'm gonna turn over to Tom Muniz our chief operating officer, who is going to share our experience on designing for certification from day one and the progress we've been making on that front. So over to you, Tom, thank you.
Thanks, Mike. Uh, that did a great job setting the foundation for what we're going to talk about uh, here today. Um, just to introduce myself quickly, I'm Tom Muniz. I'm the COO here at Archer. Uh, I've been working on eVTEL airplanes for 13 years, believe it or not, which I know sounds outrageous, but it's true. Um, and just uh, wanted to share some thoughts opening here. Uh, I'm just so excited to be here today with Maker in the background. I know a lot of you saw Maker fly this morning. And in a couple hours, we're going to show you Midnight, which is going to be one of these first eVTEL aircraft to go to market. So having spent so much time on it, I just can't wait. I'm just thrilled to be here. Um, certification is actually uh, a topic that's become very close to my heart over the years, which sounds also crazy to say, but uh, believe it or not, it's true. Uh, before I get into the details here, I want to make a couple quick thank yous. Uh, guy standing over, over here, Eric Wright, heads our certification team. Uh, he's doing fantastic work. Couldn't do it without him. Just want to say thanks, Eric. And the tall guy next to him is Dave Dennison. He's our VP of engineering. Uh, leads a huge team of really dedicated engineers that are all focused on bringing this product to market and certifying it. So just want to thank you guys. Um, so what's the point of the talk today? I wanted to do three things. Uh, one is talk more about our strategy around certification that uh, Dr. Mike talked about a few minutes ago. Uh, but then also, you know, we throw around a lot of terms, certification basis, G1, means of compliance, like what does all that mean? I really want to kind of strip things back and demystify uh, the process. So we'll go through some examples and hopefully you walk away with a better understanding of what we need to do and, and kind of what's coming up. Uh, and then the, that's the last piece is to show you where we are in the process, where we're going, and what to expect uh, in, the, in the future. So with that sort of context, uh, I want to dive into the strategy. And uh, this is actually one of the things that I think most differentiates Archer from some of our competitors um, or other people working in the space. So uh, like Dr. Mike was saying earlier, a lot of people are tempted to just uh, design an airplane kind of think, oh, yeah, I'm a good engineer. We kind of know what to do. This is going to be safe. Uh, and then they decide, OK, I've iterated. I've got something that works pretty good. Let's go to the FAA. Let's figure out how to certify it. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that strategy. Uh, I've been at uh, places where we've done similar things. Uh, the issue, though, is that's not a particularly efficient way to bring a product to market in aerospace, right? Super heavily regulated. Safety is key. So from the very beginning, from my first meeting uh, with Adam back in 2019, one of the things that we really resonated and agreed on was the need to focus on certification from day one. So what does that actually mean, though? Uh, I'll tell you what it means. Uh, it means uh, as opposed to designing a product, then figuring out how to certify it, what we chose to do was work really collaboratively with FAA, figure out what all the certification requirements are, and then design in parallel to get the most efficient path to market. And I think that's pretty unique. And so far, I think it's been paying dividends. Again, that's not the only way uh, you could do this, right? You could design an airplane. Then you could take it to the FAA, figure out how to certify it. And what you'll find is, even if you did a pretty good job, there's always going to be some small design gaps, right? Maybe 10% of the design needs to change. So you might think, oh, that's fine, 10%. That's easy. Uh, but the reason I love working on airplanes is because in an airplane, everything is connected. You can't just change one thing and expect everything else to stay the same, right? A uh, good example of that is weight. You know, we've talked a lot about payload and how critical that is. So let's say you designed an airplane, took it to the FAA, and then you figure it out, hey, I've got some design gaps, right? Maybe it's small, 10%. I need to add a couple systems. Uh, so where does the weight come from to close those, those design gaps? It comes from your payload. OK, no big deal, right? Maybe it's one, one thing, two things. Uh, but let's say it starts to stack up, and you need to change the structure, for example, um, we talked on our earnings call a couple weeks ago about the fact that the FAA uh, imposed a new requirement in our updated cert basis so the aircraft would be robust to bird strikes. Uh, so for us, that was no big deal because we were already designing to that. But let's say we weren't designing to that. OK, now we need thicker windscreens or we need to change the structure. So in an airplane, it's very easy for that kind of spiral of design to kind of get out of control. And then pretty quickly, you could have an airplane with no payload. And then what do you do? Well, that 10% design gap turned into 100% redesign. And so if you stack that all up in time, you can get to kind of a bad spot. And so from the very beginning of the company, we very intentionally wanted to avoid that and do everything we could to have a very efficient linear process through certification. That's really the idea, certification for day one. So um, in a couple of minutes, we'll talk more about that and how we think about synchronizing the design of the aircraft with certification. But I think you get the, you get the gist there. 
So the other theme is simplicity when it comes to certification. So that comes in a couple forms. Uh, at a high level, we very strategically chose to not, say, turn every knob up to 11 with the FAA, right? And we chose to really only push and innovate for things that were huge drivers in the performance of the aircraft. So uh, Michael and the powertrain team did a great job uh, showing you more of kind of the inside of what we're doing uh, in the new and novel areas around powertrain. Um, that's an area where it makes a big difference, like they said, whether or not you really push to get high performance uh, out of those systems, right? If we didn't have the motors and batteries, we could end up in the airplane with no payload, and that would not be very useful, right? Um, but the other thing about simplicity is we also were very uh, focused and have continued to be focused on just certifying in the US. And that was another thing that was very strategic. Uh, it's not that we don't think there are other interesting markets, um, or it's not that we think we'll never certify uh, in other countries with other regulators. It's just we're a startup company, right? We're a lean team. We're laser focused on getting to market with our first product, and it's going to be in the US. Uh, why in the US? It's because that's where we live, uh, that's where we work. And we did a bunch of analysis to figure out that's actually where most of the really interesting routes are to fly. Um, so made sense from a business perspective. And then the last point on here that I touched on a little bit is collaboration. So a uh, couple, couple angles here. Uh, one is, again, talking about the FAA. So we really value the FAA. We think of them as a partner. That's not to say we agree with them all the time. But uh, you know, it's, it's tempting to fall into this adversarial relationship with the FAA, just speaking openly. Right? Because you might come with a design you think is really good, uh, but you might find some different opinion at the FAA. Um, so for us, from the very beginning, again, we built this very collaborative relationship where we're showing the FAA that we're really careful, safety is our top priority, and just here's all the data, right? Here's why we think this is okay. And then we would love and welcome any opinion that they have. So that sort of collaborative approach, I think, has really been uh, paying off so far with the progress we've made. Uh, the other angle on collaboration around certification is, again, going back to, we don't want to bite off more than we can chew, right? We want to get to market as soon as possible. Uh, in this room, there's probably 30 or 40 of our uh, best, uh, most important suppliers. So thank you all for, uh, for being here, uh, for coming, and for, for the partnerships. Uh, but again, back to what uh, we talked about a couple times, we uh, intentionally chose to partner and leverage the great uh, capabilities that exist in the aerospace supply base uh, today. It's very intentional. Again, why? It's because that speeds our path to market, makes certification earlier, uh, easier. So hopefully that, uh, that makes sense. OK. So now we'll kind of shift gears away from strategy and talk a little bit more about what is certification, how it works, what some of the words uh, that we throw around are. So to kind of set the stage for that, first thing I thought it'd be useful to talk about is when we talk about certification, what's being certified? And the reality is there's lots of different things being certified. Most of the time, we're talking about the aircraft design, right? When we talk about a type certificate, that's the piece of paper you get that says the aircraft that you've designed meets all the safety requirements, and it's safe to fly. But there's a lot of other things that we work on. So a different part of the FAA works on airline operations and the rules around how uh, these airplane are, airplanes are flown uh, to make sure they're operated very safely. Uh, just because you have a good design doesn't mean every airplane you make is safe and well made, uh, you know, constructed properly. So there's other aspects of certification that have to do with manufacturing. And those are intended to ensure that the airplanes that we build match the design that's been um, approved. And then lastly, there's pilots uh, that operate our aircraft. So they need to be trained um, and uh, they need to operate the aircraft safely. So there's another effort. Uh, that we're working on with the FAA that goes to uh, pilot training, making sure that's safe as well. OK. So now let's look at that in the context of the FAA. And this is probably the part of the presentation where you're saying, wow, why am I looking at an org chart of the FAA? But just <laughs> go with me for a minute. Um, so the FAA has a really big job, right? There's uh, folks working on lots of different things. This is not the complete org chart for the FAA. This is essentially the parts of the FAA that we work with on a pretty regular basis. So you can see it spans everything from air traffic to uh, regulations around airports. Uh, there's a huge organization called Aviation Safety that deals with both the operation of the aircraft as well as the certification and manufacturing of the vehicles. 
Um, there's a big legal team at the FA that works uh, with the policy folks, like Dr. Mike was saying earlier. And then finally, there's this uh, cool group within the FAA called NextGen, and they're tasked with pulling together all these different efforts at the FAA to make sure that we get everything we need to go launch the business, right, across all of these um, groups. So um, Dr. Mike talked about it a little bit earlier. Uh, if you're a new company and you want to start building a new product, who do you go to at the FAA? So you start with uh, policy and innovation. So that box was uh, Mike Romanowski until pretty recently. Um, what do you do with those folks? You come in with an idea. So to put that into context, uh, Maker, the aircraft that you saw fly earlier and the one that's in the back of the room here, that was uh, very intentionally developed as part of our strategy to have a flying test bed that we could use to collaborate really early with the FAA as we worked through the early requirements for certification. Again, going back to that strategy where if we just jumped to the final product and said, hey, we designed this, let's certify it, clearly we'd learn stuff and we'd have to make changes. So a maker's been an, in, an invaluable asset, basically, to have the back and forth with the FAA and really accelerate the path uh, forward for midnight. Um, so just kind of talking through the rest of the, the chart here. So you start in policy and in innovation. You work with them on your certification basis. You work with them on your means of compliance. These are essentially the high-level rules that you need to design to. Uh, and then once you've got that in place, you shift to another division of the FAA. These are called the aircraft certification offices. So we're specifically working with one in Los Angeles, the LA ACO. You may have, may have heard that. So those are the folks that have all the engineering uh, talent. Uh, they come and watch your tests, they look at your data, those are the people that really know airplanes. Uh, and then there's other groups that work on manufacturing, like we talked about earlier, and operations. All right. So, now, if we just focus on that aircraft type certification process that I mentioned earlier, kind of on the chart with the four pillars, uh, I like to think of it in two big phases. The first phase, you can think of as the requirements definition phase. What does that mean? It means this back and forth uh, negotiation discussion around, well, what are all the rules that apply? And how are you gonna show that you meet those rules? And at the end of the day, you, you know, once you kind of gone through all the work, you end up with a very detailed set of information that you can use to go design an airplane and plan an airplane program. But you don't, know, you don't want to wait and do that all at the beginning. You kind of have to do it as you go. Uh, so after you've got those requirements in place, what do you do then? Well, you go build the airplane that you designed and you test it and you see, does it meet the requirements? And uh, after that, you, you get all this data, you write some reports, you go to the FAA and that's it at a high level. Once they're happy with all the documents, you're good to go. So this is the part of the talk where you're like, wow, we're still talking about this and means of compliance and compliance finding and what does that mean? So um, I was trying to think of a good analogy to kind of make it not so boring. And uh, kind of fun fact about me, outside of work, one of my big hobbies is making pizza, specifically like Neapolitan pizza. I've got a special oven, I've got the special tomatoes, it's the whole thing. Um, so uh, another random fact is you can actually get certified to make authentic, certified Neapolitan pizza. It's like there's an international organization in Italy, it's a real thing. Uh, you gotta use the right flour, it's, it's so yeah, it's a real thing. So. If you think about kind of that as a simple analogy here, uh, the way to think about these first three phases is you're basically building a recipe, right? And certification basis, that's the very high level recipe, right? You use some flour, you use some water in the dough, some tomatoes, whatever. Uh, as you go down means compliance, cert plans, this is getting much more detailed, right? So you've got you know, the certain amount of the ingredients, right? And this is how you weigh them and blah, 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 such that by the time you get to the certification plans, these are the actual really detailed executable plans to go build and certify the airplane. So then you've got the recipe, what do you do after? Well, you go bake the pizza, right? You build the airplane. And then when you've done that, you uh, take a bite, right? And does it pass the test? taste test, and so you can think of that as kind of a simple analogy for what we're talking about uh, here. All right, so um, kind of circling back to one of the themes at the beginning, this idea of synchronizing design and certification. Uh, the, the big thing here is, as we've been talking about, we don't wanna get too far down the design path without having uh, certainty on the certification pathway. Why? Because we don't wanna have these design cycles like we talked about. 
Uh, but again, you can't go too far down the certification path without having the design, because the FAA doesn't design anything for you. They just won't. You have to come to them, and then they'll give you feedback. So the kind of right way to do it, we think, is staging our certification phases with our engineering development phases. So uh, right now we're in the detailed design phase of the midnight development effort. What does that mean? It means the very high level design is, is very much set and we're now working on the details like you know, the exact drawing for the bracket that holds the flight computer, things like that. Um, so at the same time on the certification side, we're working on the certification plans. You can see step three here, right? And all of this is kind of making that bridge from the high level requirements phase into that implementation or compliance finding phase. So what's next for us? It's you know, building parts and testing those parts and getting data, et cetera. Okay, so the pizza example, kind of funny. Uh, I wanna give you a real example though now to help uh, understand exactly what the stuff looks like. So we're gonna go through a pretty simple example for how we certify structural materials for our aircraft. And uh, don't worry, it'll be painless. Five minutes, trust me. Uh, so uh, the cert basis. We've been talking about this for a long time. What is it, right? Well, here's a screenshot and an excerpt from some of ours. Uh, it's one document. Ours is only 42 pages. What does that mean? It's pretty high level requirements for what the airplane needs to do. They're all safety based. So in this structural materials example, uh, I'm not gonna read what's on the slide here, but it basically says, you need to know how strong the materials are that you use, and you need to be able to prove that, and you need to take into account variation in those materials. It's like super reasonable. But it's also kind of abstract, like how exactly do you do that, right? So how you do that, that's the next step. So means of compliance. We've also been talking about this uh, quite a bit lately. Uh, so for us, this is also one document, but instead of 42 pages, it's more like 300 pages. And why is that? It's because there's a lot more detail. So if you think back to the recipe analogy, this is you know, beyond we need some flour and water and yeast, this is we need you know, very specific amounts of things and specific processes. And in aerospace, a useful way of doing this is by leveraging uh, existing standards, industry consensus standards, um, for example, like the one shown here from ASTM, so ASTM is a, is a group that basically works across industry where companies come together, share data and agree on, yeah, these are widely accepted uh, processes for doing standard things. There's other ones, uh, Alex mentioned RTCA, that's another one that's pretty common, or SAE, you've probably heard that. Um, so here in this example, we're referencing an ASTM standard that has a bunch more detail around how you show that you understand how your materials perform. Okay, so means of compliance. Got it. Okay, so certification plans. This is again what we're focused on today. So what I've got here is just a table of contents from one of our certification plans. This is the one that has to do with uh, qualifying our materials and processes, same example. Um, so for us, uh, for, for midnight I should say, we'll have 18 of these documents. And these are pretty serious documents, right? They're like 100 pages each, you know, give or take. And again, they have the very detailed plans for exactly what we're going to do, exactly what the FAA is going to do, and the timelines we're gonna get it done. You could kind of think of it like a contract where if we go and execute to exactly what we've got laid out here and all the data is supporting the design, then we're in good shape. Um, so that's like pretty much the bulk of what we're working on today from a certification side. And we'll deep dive that uh, in a minute. But just carrying forward, Okay, so you've got those cert plans. Now we're shifting into the implementation phase, right? This is like the bake the pizza phase. Um, so what do you do there? You write a bunch of test plans like this. So now we're like super in the weeds. This is a table of contents for a very particular test that we're doing to test a very particular thing about some of our materials. So, you know, you, uh, you develop hundreds of these. And then you go out and you actually do the test. So you build a test panel and you induce some damage into it, and then you inspect it ultrasonically or with thermography, whatever. You take a cross section, you look at the data, the FAs and they're looking at the data with you, right? And at the end, it's, it's just all to prove you know that the design is safe and you understand what's going on. Okay, so then once you've got all that done, obviously the data has to look good. Like if you get bad data, you have to change things. But once everything looks good, 
It's essentially a matter of summarizing all of that into about 200 reports, submitting those to the FAA, and once those are all signed off, that's how you get a type certificate. So hopefully that gives you a better sense for, for where, we are, where we are and what's going on. Okay, so jumping back to this idea of synchronizing the design and certification. Um, again, today we're in the detailed design phase. Uh, the next big milestone for us is our critical design review, CDR, that's coming up first half of next year. Um, and on the certification side, again, we're focused on cert plans, right? Uh, number three here. Uh, we've talked a lot about how the FAA made this switch from 2117A to 2117B. I don't think we need to go into those details here because we've talked about it so much, but essentially today our means of compliance are largely understood. The FAA is going through the process of uh, reviewing those and signing them off, uh, but today we're, we're working on cert plans and uh, we've actually submitted our first one. We did that maybe a month ago, something like that. Uh, the other point that I wanted to make on this chart is uh, at a high level, right, these things are serial, meaning you need to do them step by step. Uh, but in practice, a lot of this is being done in parallel. Why is that? It's because uh, every part or system on the aircraft has to go through this process. And you don't need to wait for every single thing to be done at one step before you go to the next step. Uh, in general, you just want to make sure, again, these things are synchronized kind of between the maturity of certification and, and uh, engineering, right? But that doesn't necessarily have to mean exactly one by one. So cert plans. Since this is what we're working on now, we want it to be just super transparent about exactly what that looks like. So I mentioned earlier, we've got 18 cert plans. Uh, here they are. Uh, the one that we submitted already is our software certification plan. The reason that one was important to, to get on early is because software for airspace takes a long time to develop. Um, but the other thing we want to be transparent about is not all CERT plans are created equal. Uh, that's not to say anything is easy, but some are much more straightforward than others. So on the right hand of the chart, we've got this idea of relative complexity. So just talking through some examples there, uh, probably no surprise, the higher complexity things are the things that are new and novel for the FAA. So uh, batteries, um, motors, or electric engines, as the FAA likes to call them. Um, those are the things that we've really focused discussions with FAA on over the past year or so, because it's, uh, you know, the FAA doesn't have as much experience with those things. A lot of the back and forth with the FAA is about trust, right, and showing that, you, you know, we understand things and they understand things. So those are the areas that are, are more complicated. The other one is the flight controls uh, certification effort. So uh, in our flight control system, we leverage a lot of commercial off-the-shelf um, solutions, uh, flight computers, for example, and uh, um, other sensors and things like that. But for EV tall aircraft, uh, there's some new uh, aspects of that, right? You saw Maker Fly today. Hopefully one of the takeaways was how uh, well controlled it was. So um, at least from my perspective, super stable, right? Through transition, it just looked like it flew perfectly. Why is that? It's because it's got this um, pretty sophisticated software and sensor package on board that lets the aircraft fly much more um, controlled and precisely than if there were a pilot uh, in the loop. So a lot of that um, for midnight will be carried forward in the sense that while we'll have a pilot, the pilot's not gonna be commanding the aileron directly, right? Or a particular motor to spin faster or slower. They're sending high level signals like let's turn left or let's go up. And then the airplane and all its sensors and the compute platform, it decides exactly what the best way to achieve what the pilot wants is. So a lot of that um, learning on Maker transfers forward. Okay, um, but last point here, uh, there are other certification plans that are low complexity. Again, not because they're easy, but because strategically we've chosen to take a more conventional path or partner with uh, some of the companies in this, in this room, right? So uh, the flight deck, for example, we're not developing brand new hardware for the flight deck, right? We're working with uh, well-established uh, top-notch suppliers, um, environmental control systems, similar. Um, you get the idea. All right. So uh, what's next and where are we today? The next big thing you should look out for for us is to see our airworthiness criteria from our updated cert basis published in the Federal Register. That should happen within the next few weeks. Um, that's not so much a big milestone for us and that it helps us move forward. It's more you should keep an eye out because uh, there's interesting stuff in there, right? And it just essentially shows where we are. 
Um, I mentioned earlier our means of compliance. So the idea there is, again, this change from 2117A to B essentially reset some of the approvals. So the FAA is now going through those and approving them, mostly an, an administrative thing. Uh, goals to still get that done this year, but it's going to come down to how quickly we and the FAA could, uh, could get through it. But then more critically, it's the CERT plans we just talked about. So today, all of those 18 CERT plans are drafted. They're all in really good, good shape. We're essentially ready to submit those to the FAA as soon as it's um, practical, just based off of their bandwidth and ours and kind of you know, which systems we're going to choose to focus on at any given time. Uh, but then after that, we start to get into the really exciting stuff. So next year, we're going to be building our uh, midnight aircraft. We're going to be building conforming hardware, meaning hardware that's built to the exact engineering definition. Uh, we're going to start doing tests. Or we're going to start taking certification credit for those tests, right? Starting to write some of those reports that we talked about. All working towards our goal of receiving type certification for midnight before the end of 2024. And today, we feel really good about our position there. So with that, I hope you walk away with a slightly better understanding of certification. Um, thanks for your attention. I know it's not the most interesting thing, but uh, happy to answer any questions uh, later. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Tom. So if we just do a checkpoint, so we've talked through our, our technology, and a theme there was you know, path, to, path to commercialization and how that enables it. We talked through our certification uh, process and how that's enabling certification or commercialization. So then what does commercialization look like? And so we're going to walk you through what that does look like. Uh, I'm going to introduce our founder and CEO, Adam Goldstein, and our partner, uh, Mike Leskinen, to help us understand what does commercialization look like. All right. You survived certification. It's a really important section, and I'm glad you guys took the, the time to learn about it. I can't tell you how many times and how many people in this room, I won't call them out, have asked me what each of those diff different components actually mean. And so we thought it'd be really helpful to do that. Um, I do get asked a lot about what I'm most proud of with all these accomplishments that were really kind of taking place at Archer, and it's really the team. The team is just such an incredible group of people that have come together to build this amazing program. Um, I think you saw some of it today, um, you know, Tom Munez and Jeff Bauer. I mean, these are like the original eVTOL like pioneers that were building the very first planes and running two of the biggest programs in the industry, coming back together, coming over at Archer to help us get this vehicle to market. Um, on the powertrain team, uh, you know, Dr. Swaykooch ran powertrain at Tesla. They scaled it up from, you know, very few vehicles to a lot of vehicles, when we obviously know kind of where, where Tesla is today. And, you know, Alex and Alan that are running big critical components have such incredible experience. And then I think it's really interesting to point out Dr. Mike's experience at the FAA, right? If you remember that box that Tom showed, policy and innovation, that's what Dr. Mike ran. So all the EB tall players went through Dr. Mike. He got a chance to see everything. And not only was Dr. Mike convinced that the industry was actually making real progress and going to get certified, he chose to join one of those leading companies. And so what better way to bet than with your own, uh, you know, with your own feet? So an amazing team that's come together um, to really build a company that we can hopefully commercialize here in 2024. So what does that even mean, commercialize? We want to be the first company to bring an eVTOL aircraft to market. And we're really focused on simplifying that mission to get to market and keeping our eye on a very, very focused price. How big is that market? Well, we've heard lots of different estimates. There's analysts in here ranging from hundreds of billions to, I think Morgan Stanley put out a $9 trillion number. So of course, we always like to show uh, the big ones. And um, I think we all, though, can, we all can agree it's, it's going to be a big market. And so really now it's all about closing that gap from moving this industry from this R&D phase, which it's been in for so long, to the real commercialization phase. We took an approach that was different than I think a lot of the other companies. And that approach really started with a business case and not actually the technology. A lot of, a lot of the industry started with technology. Let's build a 
high flying, fast flying vehicle. Archer said, no, let's take, a, let's take a step back. What vehicle would actually serve the market best? And where is the, the big part of the tail in this market? And so we took a data-driven approach where we looked at where people are traveling today on the ground and where they're spending an incredible amount of time in a car stuck in traffic. And what we found was there are millions and millions of people on an everyday basis that are willing to spend 60, 90 minutes in a car on a very short 20-mile trip. LA is a fantastic example. We've used it a lot of times. Greater than 5 million people a day spend longer than an hour in a car going 20 miles or less. New York City is another great example. Almost 30 million people a year just go from Manhattan to one of the three airports, Newark, JFK, or LaGuardia. That's a brutal 60, 90 minute trip. So we defined a very clear market that we were going to go after and build a vehicle designed specifically for that market. And that's building a vehicle that can do these back-to-back 20-mile -back trips. So it looks like there's all these companies that are going after this market. And how do we tell the difference between who's advancing and who's not advancing? And you know, I, there's, there's lots of articles that are saying there's hundreds of companies doing this. And so we like to apply a really simple filter to help describe where Archer fits in into this industry. So the, probably the, <laughs> the best filter that knocks out most of the companies is capital. This is a very capital intensive business. It takes a lot of money to get through the certification process. And we don't believe you can do it for less than $500 million, but we think the number is probably closer to a billion dollars. When you take that filter alone, it really reduces the scale down considerably. But there's three other factors we like to put on there. One, looking at companies with a fixed wing. And the reason we do that is in order to compete against the missions that we are going to be flying, meaning 20 mile trips, but with rapid back-to-back -back missions, you need a wing in order to, to remain efficient. If you don't, you'll drain the whole battery and you have to sit on the ground charging all the time. Two is we're focused on, or I guess three, we're focused on the urban air mobility market. So we're not focused on regional. So there's some great companies building regional um, you know, aircraft and that's a different market that we're not considering. And then fourth is piloted aircraft. I think it's imperative that if you wanna get to market anytime soon, you're gonna have to put a pilot in these vehicles in order to get through the FAA. When you do that filter, it really brings you down to two companies. It's Archer and Joby. And so there are great companies out there that are building, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of other ones that get there. But today, these really simple filters shows you that there's only a handful of companies that are as far along as we are. So what you've heard today has been a lot about building a vehicle that's getting to market, but doing it with the lowest amount of risk. And so we thought we'd really peel back some layers and try to show you this. And so on the battery side, we wanted to really help introduce, I don't know if there's any other company that's introduced the exact cell that they're using and really try to explain the benefits of why we're doing that. Cylindrical cells are a great choice because they offer a really safe route to certify. We've seen these cells being used in cars every day. We've seen these cells being mass manufactured so we still can meet our mission profile with cylindrical cells, while at the same time minimizing risk and maximizing safety. And so there may be benefits to using a higher power pouch cell, for example, but we can still do our mission with a much safer cell. So why would we go to a higher power riskier cell? We've incorporated that theme all the way across the entire company. That is within every segment of this company is how do you build the most simple version that could help us get to market quickly while still maintaining the performance necessary to be economically viable. In the end, it ca we came up with a concept that will allow us to bring to market a piloted plus four passenger vehicle. And we talk about that thousand pound payload a lot because it's so hard to achieve. And there's so many choices that can be made, trade-offs that can be made that puts that payload at risk. So there's a lot of groups out there that are gonna talk about four passengers, but I haven't heard a lot of talk on the actual payload that companies can bring because it's so hard. You have to be far along in your design process to really lock that in. You have to be far along with your uh, suppliers and signing up you know, that, all the different components that are coming to the airplane to be able to say that with confidence. And Archer's gotten there. And so to date, we've signed up nearly two thirds of our 
suppliers to across our entire bill of materials. So we have a lot of confidence that we can actually build this vehicle and hit the payload that we're talking about. Um, Dr. Michael Swaykuch talked a lot about focusing on in-house development only on key enabling technologies, this concept of realistic innovation. That's another concept that's really spread widely throughout this company. I get often asked, well, how is this industry going to roll out? How are we going to, we're going to commercialize? What's this world going to look like in 2030 or beyond? I like to break the industry up into three distinct phases. The first phase really is all about getting to market. And so it's basically everything that you've seen up to today until the end of 2024 when we certify. The next go-to-market portion is really this 24 to 28 time frame where we'll start relatively small. There'll be routes point to point in one city, and then multiple routes in one city, and then multiple routes in multiple cities, and we'll start to grow this out. At the same time, you'll see these vehicles be used in other use cases outside of just urban air mobility. I think helicopter replacement is a really attractive go-to-market strategy, and you'll see a lot of that start to take place within this same time period. When you hit the 2028 time frame, you really can start to think about how do we build more than hundreds of vehicles? How do we start thinking about thousands of vehicles? And I don't say that lightly. That's very difficult to scale up these vehicles. We've done a lot of work laying the, the, the foundation, working with Stellantis and helping think through high-scale composites. How do we build lots of composites? How do we even think about laying out the factory so we can scale from hundreds of planes to thousands of planes? We did that from the very beginning. When we hit that 2028 20, time frame, we believe the demand will be there. We'll be able to scale up these vehicles and ultimately bring thousands of vehicles to market. When you step back and think about it, though, there's around 50,000 helicopters today. And so we're telling you we're going to build hundreds, up to thousands, and by the end of the decade, less than 6,000 planes. And so we're not even denting the helicopter market by the end of this decade. So there's just so much room to grow into this industry, and there's so much room for multiple players to get to market. So we have two ways that we're going to monetize the business. The first one is what we call Archer Direct. And this is where we will sell vehicles. So I do think helicopter replacement is a really good use case here. So if you can imagine, you go to Hawaii, you want to do a sightseeing trip, you have two choices. One vehicle is an electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft with zero single points of failure. It's good for the environment. The other one is a helicopter. It's got 200 to 300 single points of failure. We're pretty confident people will choose to go electric. But the other Archer Direct component is really looking at bringing the urban air mobility market to life. And so we partnered with United Airlines. And we announced back in 2021 a purchase agreement where United will be buying um, several planes from us, 200 airplanes. And we started working on really the commercialization of that project. We have gone through a joint eVTOL advisory committee where we work on things like maintenance or route planning or um, any operational planning. Um, we even got far enough along in our technical progress where United felt confident to put down the first uh, pre-delivery payment in the industry, $10 million. And so we've been engaged with other airlines and we've been having other um, conversations. And I think over time, you'll hear more partnerships that will come along, but United has been there from the very beginning, partnered with us hand in hand, and we're very thankful to have them as a partner. The second really leg of our commercialization strategy is the urban air mobility segment. And this is really the Archer um, branded airline where we will take customers passengers on these 20-mile rapid back-to-back -back trips. We'll start small, we'll start in cities, and we'll start to grow that over time. What I thought would be really interesting here would be not just to hear it from me, um, but to also bring up on stage uh, Mike Leskinen, who is the president of United Airline Ventures, who's been a partner of mine since the beginning when we you know, came out and made the announcement that we were going to be working together. And so I'd like to bring Mike up. Thanks very much, Adam. Um, I spent, uh, before joining United Airlines, I think a little bit important to talk about my history. I spent almost 20 years 
on Wall Street, um, really with a focus on aerospace and defense. And aerospace and defense, like it takes uh, decades to innovate. Um, I covered the airline sector as well. And it's an amazing sector that really since deregulation has just commoditized. You hear about ULCCs, Southwest really being the first and most successful, growing the business by making a basic product. It's a good product, they run a great airline, but a basic product, shrinking the seat pitch, uh, charging, uh, in, when you think about the latest innovation in ULCC is really charging bag fees um, and really uh, making it a bus service in the sky, uh, number one. Number two, uh, an industry that is highly, highly competitive, um, has had low margins, super capital intensive, um, really important to our uh, economy, but not something that has been great for investors and not something that's been really great for customers. Um, and so after my two decades on Wall Street, I said, well, geez, I want to maybe do something a little bit different with my experience. And I'd like to actually go out and help companies change, uh, change the way they're doing, running the business, improve the business. I thought the airline industry was an exciting place to do that. Um, and so I joined United about five years ago. Um, and about three years ago, we started a venture capital uh, operation, a team. We launched publicly the venture capital fund a year and a half ago. And that team really is in place to do a couple of things. Uh, number one is to drive innovation into the industry um, and leading with, in, with United. And we've done that in a big way and really it started with Archer. Number two, uh, this industry, you know, we, we have to cut emissions across the entire economy. But cutting emissions in transportation and particularly, particularly in aerospace uh, is, is really, really difficult. And so we're doing, we're doing that at United Ventures. And again, uh, a real first big step with, uh, with Archer and really proud to uh, have met Adam and be, be part, of this, uh, part of this adventure. Um, and, so, uh, and so that's what we're all about. We've got a great team. Um, we've been empowered by Scott Kirby, our CEO, in a very big way. Uh, and, and you're going to see more and more from us. In fact, we're going to be announcing some investments that really feed the EV tall industry. We're so passionate about this because this is going to this is going to change the way we all work and live. Um, and so, let me talk a little bit more about that. We're going to talk about a journey, uh, journey in a little bit. Um, we recently announced our first route. I lived in Manhattan for 15 years. Uh, I lived in uh, Tribeca. Uh, you know, sometimes early in the morning, it might be a 20-minute trip out to Newark Airport. I was a proud United customer when I was at J.P. Morgan. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes it could be 20, 25 minutes to get out to the airport. Sometimes it could be an hour and a half. Um, so not only is it uh, a short distance that can be a very long time, but it's unpredictable. Um, and so uh, how, do we, how do we fix that for our customer? How do we make sure our customers will be the first to be able to book a trip, not from Newark Airport to SFO, but from, uh, but from Tribeca to Menlo Park. Um, and, that, and, and, and through the booking seam, uh, through the entire channel, uh, we have seamless integration with, uh, with uh, TSA, um, and we make that trip uh, uh, special, decommoditized, uh, and predictable for our customers. And so we announced Manhattan uh, first. Uh, uh, we, you know, United Airlines, we have some of the most congested cities in the United States. You know, if you live in Atlanta, uh, you know, I love some of our competitors. There, there are some good ones and some not so good ones. But, uh, but if you live in Atlanta or if you live in Detroit, you know, the traffic is not the same. Uh, Houston, maybe not the same, right? And, but if you live in San Francisco, if you live in New York, if you live in Chicago, if you live in LA, this is gonna be life-changing. Uh, life-changing for those trips to the airport. I think, frankly, it's gonna increase demand because you're gonna take trips that you wouldn't have otherwise taken. Um, and so United Airlines, we're going to make sure that we're the first major airline to bring this to our customers. Um, and Archer's taken this pragmatic approach to get, you've heard it all today from the, from the great team, pragmatic approach to get through FAA certification, that being the big long pole in the tent to make this, to make this all work. Um, so we're launching Newark. We're going to talk, talk about the next route we're launching in coming weeks. So uh, Adam would kill me if I shared that with you today, but um, you know we've only got so many hubs. So you know, but congested cities—that's where we want to. That's where we want to operate first. And, and Newark's going to be a great first operation. We've got the downtown heliport in New York City. In fullness of time, we need to have 10, 20, 50 uh, vertiports within the city. The key here is that our customers are going to be able to walk to the heliport, walk to the vertiport. They can't get in an Uber and go to the vertiport then have their five, seven minute trip to Newark Airport, and then have to take some sort of a bus outside of security to get, 
to the terminal, and then who knows what the TSA line is. That's not going to work. The utility of this service is going to is going to rely on all of those pieces be connected together. And so we're working on that now, and you're going to hear more from us over time. Let's talk about a little bit of a journey. So you wake up, uh, you know, uh, for for a day trip if you're in Manhattan. Um, Scott, uh, you know, he lives in in Soho. He has a short walk out to the uh, to the Vertiport. Um, you know, maybe initially we've got to take an Uber. That's a short uh, Uber trip to the uh, to the Vertiport. Um, but then once you get to the Vertiport, you know, we we've got to decide whether the TSA is at the Vertiport or it's at the airport. But it'd be a specialized TSA at the airport. Um, but you get there quickly, speed through the TSA. It's going to be expedited. Has to be for all this to work. Ten minute or less trip to the airport. You're going to come inside security, so you're not going to have any TSA there, or if you do, it'll be an expedited line, as I said. Um, and then you're inside the terminal. You'll walk. Uh, you know, we got some ideas where we're going to locate uh, lo locate the Vertiport at Newark Airport. We're not sure of that yet, um, but it'll be a short walk then to your uh, to your airplane. And so instead of thinking about like, okay, geez, I've got a flight leaving at 7:30, so I've got to build in an hour to the airport and I want to be at the airport for an hour. So you're like leaving two hours before your 7.30 flight at like 5.30 in the morning. You know, you can leave 45 minutes before your flight. Um, and so again, you know, and then and, and reverses on the way home. So really, really going to change the value proposition to our customers. Um, and and it'd be really special that United brings that first. Um, there's lots of questions, and I'll be happy to talk to many of you after the session about kind of indicative route economics. But with the electrification of the aircraft, with the maintenance on these aircraft, with using electricity as the power source instead of kerosene, um, we think that the uh, we think that the economics. I think they start at a uh, Uber Black level, and we got plenty of customers in our congested major cities in the U.S. that are going to be very thrilled to pay Uber Black to get to the airport. Uh, and, and, and back, uh, and so I think it starts there. But as we build on the uh, economies of scale of this industry, and we start uh, increasing the frequency of the routes, increasing the vertiports, um, we will be able to bring that cost down. I think it's gonna look a lot more like an UberX, uh, a lot more like a rideshare. Um, and so uh, you know, we've talked to many of our customers. This is an uh, exciting value proposition. We had customers that have used helicopters that worked a little bit, um, <laughs> but doesn't have the same emission profile. You can't get the same frequency, et cetera. And again, you're not walking. Um, so game, game changing from that standpoint, we, we are working now on how do we get, uh, you know, how do we get the right infrastructure on the ground? How do we get the TSA in place? <laughs> Sorry, I'm losing my voice a little bit. <laughs> um, how do we get the TSA in place? How are we gonna get pilot training? How do we integrate this? We have a pilot academy, first in the industry, called Aviate. <clears throat> how do we get, um, uh, this eVTOL integrated with that. Um, Adam mentioned uh, that we, not only do we make the first route announcement, but we made a deposit here recently. We are also making investments in other eVTOL manufacturers and other eVTOL um, components of the infrastructure. Some of those have, we've announced, some we have not. Who's gonna operate these aircraft for us? Um, we announced this with uh, Mesa, which is one of our uh, great regional operators. Um, we have several regional operators uh, at, at United. Uh, in addition to that, I think probably for the first aircraft, we're gonna wanna work very closely with Archer, and so I think it's likely Archer operates those, uh, those early aircraft. Um, so look, uh, thrill, thrilled about what we're doing here. We're changing the emission profile of the business. We are leading the industry through innovation, and we couldn't have found another, a, a better partner uh, than, than with Adam. Now, I uh, am sorry that uh, my CEO, Scott Kirby, has not made it today, but I do want to leave you with a little message from him to let you all know how important this mission is to United Airlines and all the way to the top. Hello, Archer team. Congratulations on the launch of the Midnight Aircraft. I'm sorry I can't be with you today, but I wanted to congratulate you uh, and also say we at United Airlines really appreciate the partnership. When we look for a partner, uh, we look for a company with leadership like Adam and a team that had the engineering talent, the drive, the entrepreneurial spirit to really create an entirely new industry. This is just one more step on your journey. We're honored to be a partner. Congratulations and thank you.
Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. Thanks Alan. All right, that concludes our scheduled programming. So we're gonna spend a little time, feel free to hang out. You can go walk around Maker and um, be happy to answer some questions about it. And then as the group um, hangs out, Luis, I believe four o'clock, we'll make our way over. Yeah, four o'clock, we'll make our way over just across the street um, to the hangar where we will unveil midnight. So thank you all for listening.